One of the things that I love is that two films idea of your life. And there's like two stories you can tell. One that is safe and full of regret, and one that is risky and full of pride and joy. This evening, I want to talk about resilience. You know, resilience is a word that gets used a lot. And actually, it's a word um, I don't really like. Uh, resilience is one quality I don't like to find in people because the resilient people I meet are the people that have suffered in life. I've been asked a lot because of my own personal experience during this current crisis, how do I become more resilient? And I don't believe you actually can make yourself more resilient. Um, and what I want to do is try and explain uh, that belief and that kind of uh, reasoning. And I'm going to start, as I always do, with a story. Um, a story about a woman called Olive, a woman who really taught me what resilience means. Olive um, is Rwandan. She is a, a Tutsi. And during the Rwandan genocide, she underwent one of the most extraordinary experiences of anybody I've ever met working as a documentary photographer. I was in Rwanda doing a story a couple of years ago about the genocide, um, documenting and photographing people that had survived when I was introduced to Olive. Olive is a larger than life character. Um, I met her at her house. Uh, we were chatting, we were laughing. And she told me very briefly her story. But I felt she hadn't really told me the, the full kind of story that she had to tell. So I said, could I come back tomorrow? Um, I discovered it was her birthday the next day. So I went back with a, a lovely big cake. Um, it turned out she actually had never celebrated her birthday in her life. So it was a really big special occasion. Um, we had a few beers, um, we danced, we had a, a great day. And then at the end of the day, she, she pulled me aside and she said, I'm ready to tell you my story now. And this is Olive's story. So Olive was about 21 years old um, at the time of the genocide. She was expecting her third child. She had gone into hospital. Um, she actually walked there with her friend, um, her best friend Clementine, who was a Hutu. Um, as I said, uh, Olive was Tutsi. They got to the hospital. Um, as Olive was just going into labor, the president's plane was shot down. That was the start of what would become the genocide. So as Olive was giving birth, she could hear on the radio these reports of militias starting to attack Tutsis, of Hutu, uh, setting up roadblocks, uh, that these attacks were happening. Her friend was obviously very worried and said, well, I'll go home to the village and find out what's happening and let you know. Um, and obviously Olive was very preoccupied uh, by giving birth. Literally in the moments, as she was giving birth, her village was attacked. In that attack, her husband was killed, her two children were killed, her parents were killed, uh, her brothers and sisters were killed. In the very moment of giving birth to her son, every single living member of Olive's family was massacred. She heard the news um, and obviously was, was devastated, but also was stuck because by now, militias had surrounded the hospital where she was staying. The hospital was run by nuns. Um, they said, we will try and keep the Hutu militias out, but we don't know how long we can do that for. So if you imagine this young woman with her baby, knowing that every single member of her family was killed, and outside there were militias scraping their machetes across the floor, threatening like this at the windows. After two days, they burst in and they grabbed every Tutsi they could find and started dragging them out into the street. Olive knew what was coming. And she made a decision that she says to this day uh, still haunts her. She decided to leave her baby. Because her baby had no identity at this stage, nobody would know if the baby was Hutu or Tutsi. So she thought the one chance of its survival would be if she left it behind. So she left her baby uh, and was dragged out to a marketplace just around the corner from the hospital. 2,000 people were killed in the marketplace that day. Olive was one of only three survivors. Um, she hid under the bodies of everybody um, and managed to survive, but spent three days hid there under these bodies. Eventually, when she thought it was safe enough, she headed uh, to a local river and she kind of hid in the water. She spent three weeks hid in the water. 
She would crawl up at night and sleep on the riverbank and then during the day go back into the water. Um, she was so sick from malaria, insects were burrowing into her body. She showed me the scars. It meant that unfortunately she would never be able to have children again. Eventually she was so weak, she crawled um, and made it to another shelter where she waited another couple of weeks until the area was liberated. Um, the genocide in Rwanda actually only lasted 100 days, 100 brutal days. At the end of it, Olive was found. She was hardly alive. She was taken to a hospital um, and there she fought for the next couple of weeks to even stay alive. When she finally was well enough though to leave hospital, she wanted to go home and bury her family. So she returned to the village where she was from, um, but nobody knew what had happened to the bodies. The village had been burnt down. There were very few survivors. But what she did find was six uh, babies and very young children. So she decided that she would adopt them and look after them. She didn't know who they belonged to, but they had obviously belonged to her village at some point. So she took these six babies, um, moved to the capital, Kigali, and tried to rebuild her life, but she had no income, she had no family to support her. What she also didn't realize was she was suffering from PTSD, from survivor guilt. And the only work she could find was in the sex industry as a prostitute. Olive described it to me that she felt she somehow deserved that, that she was a dustbin, that each person that had sex with her reminded her of the killers of her family and that somehow she deserved this punishment. And this went on for years. Eventually, um, a NGO started working with some of the sex workers in Kigali, including Olive, and were explaining to her that this was PTSD, that she had survivor's guilt, and that she shouldn't blame herself for what happened. And something clicked in Olive's mind. She said she literally woke up one day and saw the world differently. She realized it wasn't her fault, and her responsibility was to these children that she had adopted. So they were about, uh, I think, 12, 13 years old now. And she went with them and decided to move back to the village where her family was from. But when she got back there, she found many of the killers, many of the perpetrators of the violence had already been released from prison or given amnesty. And as she walked to the market, as she took the children to the school, she would see the people that had killed her family. And she said she couldn't sleep at night. It was haunting her. She didn't know what to do. And then she made, I guess, the bravest decision anyone could do. She decided the only way for her and her family to move forward was to forgive everyone. So that's what she did. She would start to go and visit these killers and say she forgave them. Little by little, she would start coming home and noticing things like the roof on her house had been repaired or the garden had been worked over. And she realized that these killers who she'd forgiven were coming and doing work at her house and were actually repairing things. One night there was a knock on her door. She opened it and it was the leader of the militia, the guy that had actually ordered the killing of her family. She was terrified, it was late at night, he was there knocking like mad and as he stood there, she thought maybe he's gonna kill me, maybe he will silence me because I know what happened. But he said, Olive, I know what you've done, I know you've forgiven everyone. So I have come to tell you where we buried your family. And that night he walked her to an unmarked grave. Um, and when the government came the next day, they found over 300 bodies had been put in that grave. So in Olive's words, her forgiveness didn't just give her peace, but it meant that everybody in that village was finally able to lay their ghosts to sleep. There's a little twist in this story as well. Um, I told you about Camilla, um, Olive's best friend, who was Hutu um, and Olive being Tutsi. Obviously, when the genocide happened, they had become split apart. Olive, when she returned to the village, had assumed that her friend Clementine had gone into hiding. She didn't know what had happened to her. But about four years, five years after the genocide, there was a knock on the door uh, when Olive was working in the sex industry in Kigali. And she opened the door and it was Clementine. And Clementine said, I thought you were dead. I heard you were dead. And then one day somebody told me, no, Olive is alive, she's in Kigali. So she said, I knew I had to find you. And Olive was over the moon. She's like, it doesn't matter that you were Hutu, that I was Tutsi, you're my greatest friend. And they hugged and they embraced. And she said, it's like they'd never been apart. 
But then Clementine said, there was a real reason though why I had to find you. She goes, when the genocide happened, I went to the hospital. I thought you were dead, but I found your baby. And she said, I have been looking after your baby. I bring, bring him up as if he was my own. And there next to Clementine was Olive's five-year-old son who has now grown up and they were able to be reunited. And now um, he is doing well at university and Olive is, is again, a proud mother of her son and they are living a life that's quite an incredible life. Now I tell you the story because this is about resilience. When you meet Olive, you meet somebody who is so full of life, so full of energy. And as I say, at first she was hesitant about sharing the story. She hadn't shared it with anyone else. And when I asked her, why did you share this story with me? She held my hand and she said, because when I looked in your eyes, I knew you had suffered as I had. I knew you had experienced what I had experienced in your life. And that made you my brother. And this is what got me thinking about what is resilience, because I would say Olive is the most resilient person I know. Despite everything she went through, she was not able just to forgive, but able to live a life that's full and rich and generous. She is so popular in her community. As I say, she is so full of life. A party at her house is a party you will never forget. She's this amazing woman. And I was thinking, well, how was she so resilient? And I would ask her, you know, when you were going through this, when you were hiding in the river, knowing all your family was dead, your son was missing, how did you keep so much strength? And she said, but I wasn't strong. I had no strength. I just wanted to die. So again, this got me thinking, but what is resilience? And so my own personal story and the story that Olive connected with, I was um, injured in Afghanistan in 2011. I stepped on a, a landmine. I had what I call a very bad day in the office uh, working as a photographer. Um, I lost both my legs and my arm, and, and I thought those were going to be the last moments of my life. I was flown back to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Now, we talk a lot about isolation at the moment. I suffered what I call extreme isolation. I was semi-conscious, um, but I had a ventilator, so I couldn't use my mouth. I couldn't speak. Um, my one remaining hand was broken, so it was in a cast. So the only way I could communicate with the world was by blinking. Um, through the 46 days that I spent in intensive care, I was completely cut off from the outside world. I was unable to have a conversation, to interact with anybody. And if anyone has seen an intensive care unit, you know that the lights never go off, it's noisy, it's constant, it's lots of people moving around. I realized quite quickly that I was gonna go crazy if I didn't find a way to focus my mind. Um, as I say, it was extreme isolation. Um, I would describe it at first, the panic I felt, as if you'd been thrown in the sea, as if somebody had thrown you in a freezing cold ocean. All your breath is taken away, you're panicking, you're frailing around. And I thought, I can't keep going like this. I could be here for days, for weeks. How do I focus myself? So I, I started playing kind of some games in my mind. Um, one thing I knew, I had no idea of time because there's no clocks, there's no windows, there's no light, there's no day, there's no day, night. Um, and so what I did is I realized that every so often, the nurses would come and take my bloods. Now, I didn't know how long that was, but I knew it was a unit of time. So that became my unit of time. And I would set myself exercises to do in each one of those units. Um, I had a project called 100 Portraits Before I Die, where I imagined uh, 100 people I wished I'd done portraits of in my life. And I say imagined, I actually visualized it. I would imagine the person turning up for the shoot, the conversation we would have, going into the studio, how I'd light it, uh, the framing of the picture, what would happen with the print afterwards, the conversations we'd have, whether we'd have tea or coffee or wine. I visualized every moment of it. And then when the nurses came to take my blood, I would imagine the next person and, and do that. But that's how I disciplined myself and managed to get through that incredibly uh, difficult point of um, isolation. About two months after that, as I say, I was in intensive care for a month, about two months after that, um, I was in the high dependency unit, still in the hospital, still struggling with sort of uh, my health, but I was kind of past the point of potentially dying. But I had to come to deal with the real challenge. And the real challenge was coming to terms with what had happened to me. I lost both my legs, my arm. I was told I'd never walk again. I would never work again. Um, I'd lost my home. My relationship was over. Everything seemed to have disappeared. 
at that moment, three months after I was injured is when I was taken to have a shower for the first time. If you can imagine after three months, for the first time being well enough to even be transferred into a wheelchair and taken to have a shower. It was the first time I saw myself in a mirror. And I was devastated. I was so shocked by seeing myself, seeing the missing limbs, the scars across my body. It was the moment when everything really struck me. It was the reality of where I was now. When they took me back to the bed, I cried myself to sleep that night. I remember thinking, I wish I just died in Afghanistan. I wish I hadn't survived it because I couldn't deal with this new reality. I was not strong enough. I was not brave enough. I was not resilient enough to cope with this. And I remember saying to myself, I wish I was more resilient. For the next week, I'm oh, sorry, the next day, the next morning, I woke up and something had changed. I woke up the next morning with a completely different vision of my life. I woke up the next day and I remember saying to myself, from this moment on, I will never think about the things I can't do, but I will focus on what I can and I will excel at those things. And it was like I had a new lust for life. Suddenly everything seemed brighter, everything seemed louder, everything seemed clearer. And from that moment on, I spent another nine months in hospital, but I had a positive energy and belief that anything was possible. And as time went on, I was able to rebuild my career, uh, move on, and here I am eight, nine years later, enjoying life more than I ever have. And that's the thing about resilience. That's when I realized, both through Olive and myself, you do not make yourself more resilient. Resilience is nature's gift for suffering. Resilience is something that is bestowed on you by life. You do not make yourself more resilient. Resilience is the outcome of experience. When Olive was lying, hiding from uh, the Hutsu rebels when she was in the river, she wasn't resilient, but she was growing. And the resilience really came when she made that decision to go back to the home where she was from. For me, the moment of resilience was built when I spent those 46 days in intensive care, unable to communicate with the world. And the payoff was three months later when I made that decision to focus on the things I could control and not the things I couldn't. So what I would say to everybody going through this difficult experience now, I have friends that have said to me, I feel terrible because I have days when I sit and I cry and I feel overwhelmed by it. You're so resilient, why can't I be more like you? Well, people ask me, how can I be stronger? And what I would say is understand that what is happening now is change and growth. And it's fine to have days when this overwhelms. It's fine to have days when you wake up and say, this is shit. But there's days when you'll wake up and feel better. The secret is just to keep going. But what I would say, what my honest belief is from the hundreds of people I have met in conflict zones, in humanitarian disasters, and from my own experience, is that all of us at the end of this will be given a gift that all of us will discover we are more resilient, more capable, more able to deal with life's problems. And this is a tough, tough time. But trust me, in the years ahead, you will find problems that you had struggled with before this all happened will seem easier, will be able to cope with. So all I would say is keep believing in the dawn. Keep believing that this will pass and believe that you will be a more resilient and stronger person when it does. Thank you. So I'm gonna go, sorry, I'm not, I'm not just checking my Instagram, um, but I have uh, questions are being sent here to the phone. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna check. So the first one is um, from Michelle. Um, was it actually an overnight epiphany to decide to see the world differently? And I just want to thank anybody for sending the word epiphany to a dyslexic person. I appreciate that. Um, in, in many ways, it was. And I mean, it was, as I say, it, it really was that direct moment where from one night I was in tears and wished I was dead to the next morning. But that's what I'm saying is that it was three months of struggle and suffering that led to that moment. So the outcome for me was almost overnight. And it's one of the interesting things that speaking to 
I mean, when I was at the Do Lectures, I was talking about an amazing woman called Khulud who had been paralyzed by a sniper's bullet. Um, she's one of my, my closest friends. She also felt that it was almost an overnight experience where she went from not being able to cope to being able to cope. So I believe personally that, that for a lot of people, and not everybody, but for a lot of people, that change can be um, almost instant. But it's the months, the weeks that lead up to that that create that moment of change. And as I say, everybody's experience is different. Everybody has, has different levels of it. I would just say that, that you know, I've been through um, some pretty difficult times. I've documented people that have been through difficult times. And it can be this sudden moment, the sudden realization, but it's all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes in your brain in the months that lead up to that. And that's what I mean. It's, it's, resilience is a gift. It's a reward that, that nature bestows on us. I'm just checking because I don't have any more questions. It's like technical problem. Tattoos. So somebody is asking about my tattoo, which is, this one's a phoenix. I have plenty of tattoos, but this, this one is the phoenix, which for me represents quite literally for me that my life was reborn from fire. So yeah, that's, um, that's that one. So um, from Carlo, how do we best support the work you do to share those stories and in turn help those living with the immediate aftermath of the horror of war? Um, if you get a chance, go to uh, Legacy of War or Legacy of War Foundation, which is, um, I don't like to call it a charity. It's a project where we support people to rebuild life after conflict. And there's a beautiful picture there of Olive and her friends. Um, we um, were able to buy farmland for Olive and uh, 100 other survivors of the genocide. Uh, we're setting up another five projects like that in Rwanda and Uganda. Um, and it was quite a unique project. There's many cooperatives that are set up to support women, but I wanted to do something slightly different, which is that we bought the land for them. So we actually gave them the land and set up the cooperative. Um, so therefore they have complete control over it. We are simply there to advise and support. And that's what I believe, you know, in terms of, of charity, um, I don't like that word. When I was injured in hospital, I would have two groups of people, the people that would come to me and say, how can we make sure you don't have to worry about money again? We'll find somewhere for you to live. Don't worry about anything. And I didn't really want that. What I loved was the people that came to me and said, right, how are we going to get you working again? How are we going to get you doing your thing again? And that's all I've ever wanted to do as an NGO is to create that environment for people where we just sit with them and we say, okay, this is what's happened because of conflict or humanitarian disaster. How do we get you back up on your feet and doing what you do? So, you know, I, I had a long chat with an amazing woman Mina recently, who's written a great book about um, uh, feminism and most specifically feminism in, in Africa. And I was asking her about this idea of empowerment. And you can't empower someone. You know, charities talk about empowering people, but you actually can't empower anybody. What we can do as an organization is to take away some of the barriers that stop people empowering themselves. So with women in Rwanda, if we can buy them land, if we can help with the government's side of things, what we do is enable them to empower themselves. So that's, that's what my project is. So that's Legacy of War Foundation. Um, somebody was asking how you can support or get involved with what we're doing. So I'm just checking my phone again. Um, did you find, uh, this is from Anna, uh, did you find forgiveness linked to resilience? You know, I mean, Olive is interested with forgiveness. There's a whole other side actually to Olive's story which we don't have time to talk about where, where actually she introduced me to the guy that killed her family. Um, Olive has a very sense, strange sense of humor. So we got in a taxi once and I said, where are we going? And she said, oh, to see the killer. I was like, what? She says, oh, I want you to meet the killer. So she took me to this house. And it's interesting. I mean, we went in there. This guy was living in darkness, quite literally. His house had no windows. He was wearing this black shirt. I felt the energy being sucked out of everybody, even being in that room. He has very little remorse for what happened. He was convicted of killing over 300 women and children, um, but he has been released from prison. And Olive has kept this kind of strange relationship going with him because actually 
they're related by birth. It's a long story. Um, and it was funny, we were in there and I interviewed him to get his side of the story. And I wanted to try and understand if I could something about his motivations. And Olive starts whispering to me, she goes, she goes, Giles, you've really taught me even more about forgiveness. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, oh, you, she said, I decided I'm going to buy him a cow to forgive him. And I went, Olive, you're not going to buy him a cow. She's like, no, no, I thought it'd be a nice thing to do to forgive him. And I said, you're not even giving him a chicken. So we are going to have to stop Olive doing that. But that's in Olive's nature is to forgive. Um, and that's how she's been able to deal with what happened to her. In my own personal experience, I was injured by a Taliban bomb, but I never even felt anything about blame or guilt or, or, or anger with anyone. I always say I was not injured by um, the Taliban. I was not injured by a landmine. I was injured by hatred and by ignorance. And those are the things that I battle with my work, with my photography, but I never had one person I felt I should forgive or was my right to forgive. So for me personally, forgiveness was not part of the process, but I think it's an important part of the process if you have somebody very directly to blame, because I don't believe anybody can move on with their life until they are in a position to forgive. And I know that's not an easy thing, um, but for Olive, that was the only way that she could find her life. And as I say, what's interesting is the person that did the killing lives in this darkness, in misery. And Olive, because of her forgiveness, now lives a life that is actually full of joy. Um, sorry, going back to my questions. Um, from Rhonda, are you still in contact with Olive? How is she? How's her family? Yes, Olive is constantly sending me WhatsApp messages. It's one of those funny things, actually, that um, it's, it's been really wonderful during this crisis is soon after lockdown here, my phone started getting very busy early in the mornings. And I was getting messages from uh, Khulud, the woman who I have talked about before, who was paralyzed by a sniper, a Syrian woman, by Olive, everybody checking in on me. Um, these people that have gone through unimaginable hells, um, checking to make sure I was doing okay during lockdown. And that to me is one of the most yeah, wonderful things is these incredible people who I've had the privilege to document their stories have become friends who are now very, very much part of my life. Um, and actually Olive, I saw her the last time was the last trip I did away before uh, lockdown was in January. And I went there and, <laughs> and the first time I, I was telling you when I first met her, I discovered it was her birthday and we'd had this birthday party. And so this time I was there and Olive says, wow, it's amazing you would be here again on my birthday. And I was like, oh my God, I hadn't realized. So I was bluffing going, yes, that's a really good coincidence. Should we have a party on Friday? And she was like, yes, that'd be great. And then I went home and I was going, I'm sure I wasn't here in January last time. And I started going through my notes and, and my emails and realized it was a completely different time. Um, and Oliver completely bluffed me. And it wasn't anything apart from the fact that she had so enjoyed that birthday that she wanted to do it again. So I've now discovered that whenever I go back to Rwanda, it's Olive's birthday, which is fine by me. Um, from Alex, do you have a favorite image that you have created in your career? You know, that's always a really tricky one because for me, each image is a story, is a person, is something that I relate to. Um, so there's never one photograph that I look at and, and think, like I, there's no images I have on my wall of my own work. Um, but I guess the one is, you know, and I talked about it the last time at, at Do is, is Khulud and her husband where they're holding hands on bed and this woman who had been paralyzed, she's holding hands with her husband and that has always meant the most to me because that is a picture of love and it represents everything that, that I work towards, um, that even in, in life's worst moments, what you find is, is love and compassion. And so the photograph of, of yeah, Khulud and her husband Jamal would always be, if there was one photograph I would take to my grave, it would be that one because it's the photograph that represents everything that I believe in, that love is greatest force. Um, just checking. Ha, huh, from, uh, from Fro, have you ever taken any of the portraits that you imagine in hospital? And I did actually, I did a few of them. Um, who did I photograph? I photographed um, uh, Ken Loach, which was great. Um, and I photographed Stephen Fry um, and a few other people. And it was really lovely because it was exactly um, as I imagined photographing them in, in hospital. And, you know, it's, this is the final question. So what I would also say is that was an amazing thing as well when I realized that you can take away every freedom 
from somebody. Um, you can chain them to a bed. You can stop them being able to communicate. You can take away every single bit of communication, every bit of love, every bit of touch, every communication that they have through people being near them. But what you can never deny anybody is their imagination. And I have been working in um, hospitals the last couple of weeks, documenting intensive care units in London. And seeing people in intensive care has been very uh, moving for me because I remember that experience. And you see people that are in, in very bad situations on ventilators and the staff working around them covered in, in visors. And, and it would be very easy to see that. And if you saw the photographs that I've taken, you would think it's a place stripped of humanity. It's a place that looks like a movie set, like a sci-fi film. And you would think, God, there's no communication. How terrible to be there. But actually, as having been in that place myself, I was able to observe some of the little details. And you see the anesthetist or the doctor holding the hands of the patient and whispering to them. And what I would say is even when you can't communicate with the world, even when you are locked down like that, the one thing that can never be taken away from you is your imagination and your memory of love. And that's what I've been witnessing the last couple of weeks, even in this really dark time, in the probably the darkest place you could be, the intensive care unit with COVID patients. I have seen humanity and I've seen love. And as I say, those things can never be taken away from us. Thank you.